Hello everybody, welcome to Ask Abhijit episode 173. It's great to be back among you all live on this live stream. It's great to see your smiling faces. I hope you're all smiling. I'm smiling. So let's see who all is there on the live stream. I can see Mateo Perez from Texas, Kuldeep Sharma, Inderjeet, Vivekananda Reddy, Anonymous watching from Nigeria. Hello, sir, ma'am. Rachna, Justice Warrior 24 by 7, Sachin Kumar, Pratham, Priyanshi Sood, hello, Yash, Lavanya Bhatnagar, Satak Singh, Sumitram Kumar, Saksham Valya, Mehul, Three Ways, Two, Debosman, Das Gupta, Siddhant, Rohan, Keshav, Vidash, Dongar Singh Chauhan, welcome back, sir, Ankur Singh, Jaisil, Hamti, Bojack, Horseman, Siddharth, Rajpurohit, Feminist Slayer, Vinay, Esman, Siddhant, uh, Golden Yogi, Ankur Singh, Ashdeep Singh, Geopolitical Dubey, hello. Uh, lots of other people. Let's see. Lots, 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 lots. I can see. Uh, Sachin Giri, Ashu Nagra, Samarth Tete, Anonymous, Kapil, Siddhant, Nikum Mukesh, Boy21, Zubon Izung, Rahul Singh, Jai Van Pariya, Technical Advisor, Himanshu Sharma, Ajit, Ankit, Adarsh, Dipantu, Dipantu, Prashant, Nilesh Patel, Satish, Tanmai, Harsh Zaveri, hello, Ram Swaroop, Yashwant, Neil Lanch, Nim Jai, Om Partha, CP Varma, Sanat, MN, Bay Suzy, 2 Watts, 2K Watts, Crazy Brain, uh, Jatin Trudeau, <laughs> uh, Animester, Winged Star, Travel Videos, YK, Pratyush, Adi Gupta, Brijesh, IC, Ranjit Chaudhary, and so many other people. I will not be able to greet you all individually. Let me try some more. Crazy Brain, Amit, Huria, Nilanch, Vivek, Tanmay, Rogue Gamer, Mayuresh, Dutch Wanderlinde, Akarsh, Mayank, Dipantu, Himanshu, Mehul Rajesh Babu, and everybody else. So thank you all for being on the live stream. It's great to be back live on episode 173. And uh, before we begin, let me once again remind you that I have launched a geopolitics course and you can check it out. It's The link is in the description below. So why have I created this course? It's because everything I do, I believe in thinking differently. I believe in challenging the status quo. And the way I challenge the status quo is by making these videos and doing these live streams and giving you a realistic view of the world. I give you a different view of the world, not the view that TV channels and news readers and YouTubers and other analysts give you. I give you a different view of the world, which is a more realistic view. I believe in excellence. I keep on saying, raise your standards. And based on these values, I have created a geopolitics course. Based on my analytical framework, it's called Geopolitics from First Principles. And uh, check out the link in the description. It's only for people who are serious about learning geopolitics. So check it out. I'll put the link in the chat as well if you want to see that and with that said let me uh, start taking questions so let's see what questions we have i had seen a few good questions let me see all right let's begin with this this is by, by dia so dia says why didn't iran invade india you didn't answer this question in previous ask abhijit uh, live stream you kept it suspense okay uh, that's a good question so Yes. So first of all, I hope all of us know where Iran is located. In case some of us don't know, let's go to the map. Where's the map? We have to see the map to understand where this nation, this civilization, Persia, is located. So it's our neighboring, well, it used to be our neighboring country. Right now we have this temporary nation between Iran and India, which is Pakistan, matter of time. So Persia is, historically, has been the civilization west of india and uh, so that's that's iran all right and uh, if we go back into if we go back in time then we will see that persian history begins about three and a half thousand years before today we have the uh, hakshamanish dynasty the akabinid dynasty that ruled persia it was a great uh, militaristic dynasty it was an expansionist dynasty and then we had other kings and, and dynasties also that uh, followed in its footsteps and historically if we see the persian military activities their military expansions they were all westwards they fought essentially the greeks and eventually the romans and uh, you, 
well, if you look at a further larger view of history, then eventually they fought the Arabs and they were conquered by the Arabs, which uh, begins uh, the chapter of the Islamization of Persia. But historically, they fought the Greeks and later the Romans, after the Romans conquered Greece. So they always expanded westwards. And east of Persia, we had India. And India at times was unified under, under a single empire. And at times, India was fragmented into lots of different kingdoms. But the same civilization, the same culture. So the question is, why did the Persians never ever think of invading India? And some of you will say that Nadir Shah invaded India. Well, Nadir Shah, Nadir Shah he was a Turk. And that's a much later episode, just the last two, three hundred years. 400, whatever it is. You can check out the date, right? Nadir Shah was a Turk. He was not a Persian. And this happened after the Islamization of Persia, after the Arabs invaded and converted uh, all of Persia to their religion. Okay? So before the Islamization of Persia, Persia never ever tried to invade India. That's the point. And the question is a very good question. Why did they never do that? Even though they were so expansionist, they had these expansionist tendencies, they were a powerful empire and so on. Why did they not invade India? They didn't even attempt to invade India. Why is that? So to answer that, I'll have to show you a few things. So let me put something else on the screen. Let me offer you, offer you some clues. And based on the clues, we'll draw some conclusions. So this is a YouTube channel by a musician called Faria Faraji. Okay? Now, Lots of ancient music that he recreates, he or she, I think it's he. Okay, now let's search for Vahram on this channel. And there is this song, this YouTube video, it's a song, it's called The Ballad of King Vahram. Now I can't play this over here because it will give me a copyright strike or whatever, because it's, it's proprietary music, so I won't play this. But I would encourage you to check out this channel, play this video, and see the lyrics, the translation into English. If you want a translation, let me offer you a translation. So, uh, this is a research paper that was published in 1955. It's by J.C. Tavadia. I believe that person is Parsi, Indian Parsi, Indian Persian. And it's about that per particular song. Okay, it's a, it's a song in the Pahlavi language. And this song was written right after, in the aftermath of the Arabic invasion of Persia after the Persian kings were destroyed and the culture was destroyed and they started imposing their religion on Persia. So this song was written in the aftermath of the Arabic invasion uh, and, and conquest of Persia. Now let's take a look at the actual text. Let me put that on the screen because I have uh, the actual research paper, not just the abstract, I have the whole thing. Let us embiggen the size of this thing, okay? So, yeah, this is the, the whole thing. Now, let's go to the text. This is the Persian text, which is the Pahlavi text. And they have the English translation. The translation is that, when may it be that a courier comes from India and says that the Shah Vahram from the family of the Pais has come, that there are a thousand elephants, upon their heads are elephant keepers, and that he ra holds the raised standard in the manner of the Hosravas. So it is saying that the lyrics say that the writer wishes that a courier comes from India and says that the Shah Bahram from India has come with a thousand elephants to rescue Persia from the Arabs. Okay. And so it says further, an intelligent man should be made our clever interpreter who may go and speak to the Indians. Namely, see what has, I mean, I'll not go into the exact details, what we have seen from the hands of the Arabs. They have ruined the religion and killed the kings and, and so on and so forth. We are from the Arya stock. They are the Arabs are the de devas, which means in the in the Zarathustra tradition, the devas are the bad guys. Like we for us, the devas are the good guys and the asuras are the, are the bad guys. In Zoroastrianism, it is inverted. But you know what they mean. So essentially, this song says that we should send a clever interpreter to India and inform the Indians of what has been done to us, what has happened to us. The Arabs have come and destroyed our religion, our culture. They have killed our kings and they have ruined the nation and so on. They have taken away the sovereignty from the host rivers, not by skill, but by whatever, by not by skill, not by manliness. They have made mockery and scorn. They have taken away by force from men, their wives and their wealth and their sweet palaces, parks, gardens. They have imposed a tax 
okay, a certain tax, and so on. So the Persians, whoever wrote this song, that person wishes that we we can we Persians can send a messenger to the Indians and tell them what's happened to us. And clearly, this message, this writer believes that if the Indians come to know what's happened, they will come and rescue us. So what does that tell you? And this happened, this song was written in the Pahlavi language in the aftermath of the Arabic invasion of Persia. That's about how many years ago? 1300 years ago, roughly, roughly give or take. You can check out when it happened, look it up, Google it or wherever. Right? So even 1300 years ago, the Persians believed that if a message would go to the Indians, then the Indians would come with 10,000 elephants and a huge army and they would rescue Persia from the Arabs. What that tells you is that the Persians saw Indians as their kin, as their own people, as family. You understand? And he also mentions that we are from the Arya stock, the Aryan stock. The translation into English is Aryan, but the correct term is Arya. And the Persians viewed this term Arya as an ethnic term. We Indians viewed this as a, as a sign of nobility. Nobility is a noble behavior. You know, Arya means a person who is civilized. That's all it meant. It was not ethnic for us, but for the Persians who had left India long, long ago and settled to the West, for them it was an ethnic term. So that's the deal. The Persians saw India as their Indians, as their kin. They saw India as family. And when you are family, you don't fight, right? You don't invade family. You invade the others. To the West. So this song, it's very obscure. Almost no one knows about this, but it's really interesting. And it tells you a lot about the ancient relationship between Persia and India before the Islamization of Persia. And after the Islamization of Persia, lots of things changed in Persia. Even the uh, ethnic mix, the ethnic makeup of the Persian people of Persia changed Okay, today you will see in Persia, if you go to Iran, you will see lots of people, not lots, but significant amount of people who have very light skin, who have green or blue eyes. You will see people who have blonde hair, not lots, but a few. Those are people who were brought into Persia from the Caucasus region during the Turkic rule over Persia. Let me once again go to the map. Okay, this is interesting. So if you look at the map, here's the map. So we have Persia or Iran. And northwest of Persia, we have the Caucasus region, which, which is the region between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Okay, this, sea, this is the Caspian Sea here in the middle of this of the screen. And to the left of the screen, you have the Black Sea. And the region between these two seas, roughly, is the, Cas is, is the Caucasus region. And lots of people were settled from the Caucasus region into Persia by the Turks. Right? So that changed the ethnic makeup of Persia. If you look at Persia today, and if you look at the ethnic groups within Persia, you will find that the actual Persians are roughly about 50% of the population of Persia. And the rest are other ethnicities like the Azerbaijanis, the Azeris, the Arabs, and so on and so forth. Balochis also, and so on. So only half of Persia today is actually Persian. And a lot of, a lot of this, similar to what happened in Afghanistan. Today, if you look at the ethnic makeup of Afghanistan, uh, the majority people are still the Pashtuns, the Pakhtuns, okay? But there are lots of other ethnic groups who have come in after the invasion of Afghanistan, of, of Gandhar, which turned Gandhar into Afghanistan. All right? So, yeah, that's the story. So, to make a long story short, to answer the question that Dia has asked, the Persians never ever fought India. They never tried to invade India because they saw India as their own people. They saw India as the probably the ancient homeland and you don't fight family you don't fight uh, well, you do fight family but they chose not to ever because they had lots of opportunities to expand westwards and why why not go there fight the greeks fight the romans and take their lands i mean once again go to, going to the map going back to the map you will see that uh, the persians they 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 expanded westwards significantly the whole of what is today turkey which was then greece was at one point in time taken over by the king kshayarsh xerxes and uh, yeah he well he fought battles all the way in greece battle of thermopylae where a number of spartans fought the persians and so on so that's why the persians chose to fight the greeks and the westerners the ionians the yavanas and not the indians
to make a long story short. All right, let's take a different question. Kuldeep Sharma says, what's the reason for the similarity of the historical culture of the Mitanni Empire with Indian culture? What does it indicate? Okay, the Mitanni. Once again, let's go to the map. As always, map, map, map. Map tells you everything. It tells you a lot. It doesn't tell you everything, but it tells you a lot. So where is Bharat? Bharat is here. We all know where it is. Let's go westwards, westwards. Let's cross uh, the temporary nation. Let's go across Gandhar. Let's cross Persia and let's go into Mesopotamia. And over here, we have the present day nation of Turkey, which was historically Greek and Armenian. And somewhere here, we had the ancient Mitanni kingdom. Right? And the Mitanni, well, they spoke the, Hur the Mitanni language, Hurrian language, whatever it was. And they had the cuneiform script. But it it emerges it emerges because of evidence that we have found archaeological evidence that the aristocracy the ruling class of the Mitanni they spoke a different language they spoke Sanskrit and how do we know this well there was a horse master called Kikuli okay he wrote a detailed horse training manual which is still available which can still be used by the way to train battle horses. So he wrote a detailed horse training manual in the local language, but there were certain terms that were not available in the local language because that language was not evolved enough. So he was forced to use his own native language for those terms, those technical terms. Those terms he wrote in Sanskrit. And that is, strangely enough, the oldest evidence that we have of written Sanskrit anywhere in the world, even older than what we find in India. In India, we probably wrote on perishable surfaces birch bark or or you know palm leaves or maybe some form of cloth or whatever so the oldest evidence of written sanskrit is from this region and if you analyze the sanskrit that they used you will find that it is late vedic sanskrit not rig vedic sanskrit not old not early vedic sanskrit it is late vedic sanskrit which tells you that that they probably most likely went westwards out of India. And there are other, there's lots of evidence that points towards various migrations westward out of India. One of them is the Bodhiyana Shrota Sutra, which you which I invite you, which I encourage you to go check out the Bodhiyana Shrota Sutra and so on. So the reason for the similarity of the historical culture of the Mitannis with Indian culture is because they were most likely migrants out of India who went all the way westwards and settled over here between Syria and Anatolia, or present-day Turkey. And you find their treaties. Okay, They, they had these uh, alliances and treaties with neighboring kingdoms, the Mitanni and the Hittites, for example, in which they invo invoke the Vedic gods, Mitra, Varuna, and so on and so forth, Okay, as, as, as uh, witnesses to the treaty. And there's so much more evidence. I, I could speak for hours, but yeah, there you go. So the reason for the similarity is that they were migrants out of India. And there's plenty of evidence of migration out of India and westwards and northwestwards, starting from the very beginning of the Vedic age, which is the Battle of the Ten Kings. All right. Okay. Um, okay, let's see some other questions. <laughs> What's the ancient history of Israel? I mean, if I start with the ancient history of Israel, I could talk for at least an hour. But to condense it very short into, into something very small and very brief, okay, once again, I should go to the map, where is Israel? I hope you all know where it is, but let's anyway check it out. Where is Israel? So Israel is this nation on the eastern banks of the Mediterranean Sea, ancient nation, ancient culture, okay? So the Israeli people, the, the Jewish people, uh, their history goes back about 3,000 years, okay? Uh, the oldest people, uh, archaeological written evidence for for Hebrew people or Jewish people, I think it's about 3,000 or so years old. And then we have kings like King Saul, King David, King Solomon, etc., which uh, who all lived in the first half of the first millennium BCE. Uh, so so that's uh, that's the origin of the of the Hebrew or, or or Israeli or Jewish culture. And then they were taken out, their nation was invaded by the, what, Assyrians, I believe, and the Persians helped them out, and Jews were allowed to live in Persia, and eventually it was King Cyrus, King Kurush, who allowed the Jews to go and settle back in Israel, 
and then there was the, i believe solomon king solomon built a temple it was destroyed then there was a second temple which was then destroyed by the romans and uh, then you had the jewish diaspora going around the world and you know settling all across uh, mostly in in europe some of them in africa there was a time when even much of arabia had a significant jewish presence uh, iran also had a jewish presence going back to the uh, time of uh, king kurush or king cyrus and after the roman destruction the the revolt of the maccabees and the, Ro the roman occupation of judea uh, about 2000 roughly years ago some some jews even came to india and so on so this is the ancient history of israel it's an interesting topic i would encourage you to you know read about it it's interesting for sure and it uh, you read it you will understand uh, the present day situation kind of better always helps to know history all right Vyom says, can we test nuclear weapons in space? Why not? You want to see a nuclear explosion in real time? Wake up in the morning and look eastwards. But don't look at it directly. The sun. The sun is a gigantic fusion reaction. Nuclear fusion. The fusion of hydrogen atoms, hydrogen nuclei together into helium. And the light that comes out of the sun, each photon of light that comes out of the sun, takes between 100,000 to 1 million years to emerge after it is born inside. That's how dense the sun is. Uh, yeah. So the sun is a nuclear reaction. It's, it's a fusion reaction caused by the implosion of, of this enormous mass of material, mostly hydrogen gas. Now, so that we know. All these stars that we see in the night sky, Stars, not planets, but stars, those are nuclear reactions. Now, can we test nuclear weapons in space? Well, it's been done. Uh, what was it called? I don't remember the name of the test, but there was a test. Uh, the Americans tested a nuclear weapon in space. Uh, I'm sure we can, we can, yeah, let's, let's Google that. Let's go to our friend Google. And uh, yes, they have, um, yeah, so what was it called? Nuclear uh, spelling, nuclear test in space. So what was it called? Starfish Prime. There you go, Starfish Prime. So this is what it looks like. So it caused this aurora-like like, uh, phenomenon. Okay. So the Americans tested a nuclear weapon in space. Uh, there are various uh, photographs of that. So it has been done. So the short answer to your question is we can certainly test nuclear weapons in space because the nuclear uh, chain reaction doesn't de doesn't depend on things like ox the availability of oxygen. You know, you can't burn a flame in space because of the absence of oxygen, which a flame, the fire, is an exothermic reaction. It's a chemical reaction and it needs oxygen for it to happen. Without oxygen, it won't happen. So you can't burn a flame in in space in vacuum but you can certainly ignite i mean set off a, a, a chain reaction a nuclear chain reaction a fission reaction fusion reaction whatever in space so yes you can certainly test nuclear weapons in space all right uh let us see what else Um, all right. Uh, Jai Ved says, will the ongoing de-radicalization in the Middle East solve the identity crisis in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and 56 OIC nations? Since all the roots lie in Saudi, Qatar, etc. So I'm talking, I'm sure you're talking about the the Islamic religion, the Muslim religion, right? Islam. Uh, yeah, so we are seeing this process of de-radicalization in the Middle East. So if you look at historic Arabia, the nation that is now Saudi Arabia, it was historically the Arabian Peninsula. Once again, let us go to the map to, to see the place, right? Let's do that. Uh, I'm sure we all know where the Arabian Peninsula is, but just in case, let's let's see. So it's, it's our neighboring region. Just go west of India, cross the Sea of Saurashtra, and you will reach the Arabian Peninsula. You reach Oman, you go further so for the West, you will reach Saudi Arabia. So the religion, Islam, it obviously emerged out of this region from uh, Mecca, Medina and all that. 
So, and historically, if you look, if you go back 100 years, 150 years, uh, the kind of Islam, the form of Islam that was practiced in this region was quite different from what was practiced in the 20th century. In the 20th century, you had a more austere, more, uh, a more fundamental, or I'm, I'm not sure, more radical or whatever you want to call it, form of Islam. It's called Wahhabism that was in vogue in the Arabian Peninsula. It is something that was encouraged by the West. The West needed to, to maintain control over this region because of the oil reserves. At that time, when I talk about the West, I mean the US and the UK and eventually just the US. The UK became irrelevant 1956 onwards. So it was the US that this region was, was essential for the US. See, no power... Okay, no, no geopolitical power can survive without energy. And the more powerful you are, the more energy you need. And this was this region was a source of energy for the US. And it essentially owned this region. Right? Uh, it had complete control over this region. It still has, actually, to a very significant extent. And so they they encouraged the local leaders, the local uh, monarchies, to impose a very strict and very uh uh austere, very radical form of Islam on the region to keep people under a great amount of very strict control. And now that the US doesn't need the Gulf oil, because it is now self-sufficient in oil, now it doesn't care. Right? So now we are seeing, and now we are seeing that the world is slowly beginning to move away from, from, uh, from oil, from uh, petrochemical sources of energy maybe towards something else. So in, in the Arabian Peninsula, the nations over here know that they cannot keep on relying on their oil reserves and oil exports forever. They need to change. They need to start catching up with the world. They start, need to start attracting investment. They need to start attracting people to come into the country and invest and, and settle down all that. So to do that, they need to open up the economy. They need to open up the society as well. So we are seeing that process in action over there. So we have uh, very young, uh, dynamic leaders like uh, like uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is doing that in Saudi Arabia. We have the UAE, which is a wonderful place, very liberal, very open. Uh, we have a Hindu temple that recently came up over there, Bab's uh, Hindu Mandir in Abu Dhabi, and so on. So we are seeing significant changes happening over here. And yeah, you could call it de-radicalization or whatever you want. So we think that uh, over there. But will it solve the identity uh, identity identity crisis in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc.? I don't think so. I think it could it could trigger a, a rather opposite kind of reaction in in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and so on. Probably, possibly. I'm not sure because I'm not a great uh, expert in in uh, Islamic matters. But yeah, I, I think it could have the opposite kind of effect outside of the Arabian Peninsula. Let's see how it goes. We shall see. All right, next question. Um, Karan Nalavat says, why is mathematics considered the language of the universe? Well, to answer that question, we have to first ask ourselves, what is mathematics? We know that 1 plus 1 is 2. And 1 plus 1 is 2 here, where I am over here. It is 1, one plus 1 is 2 wherever you are. 1 plus 1 is 2 on the moon, it's 1, one plus 1 is 2 on Mars. It's it's true everywhere that we know of in the universe, right? And similarly, we have 2 plus 2 is 4 and so on and so forth, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Then you have other branches of mathematics, you have calculus, you have geometry. All of these things, what do they represent? They represent the they represent the regularities and patterns of the universe. So these are universal facts. And what we find is that using mathematics, you can formulate the laws of nature, physics. So that's that's why mathematics hints to, to a deeper truth. So if you were a programmer, okay, <laughs> if you were a programmer and you programmed the universe, then mathematics was the language in which this programming was done. So if this universe is a simulation that we live in, and there's a programmer out there beyond the universe who wrote the code and did the programming and the language of programming was mathematics. So yeah, that's why to put it very 
briefly, that's why mathematics is considered to be the language of the universe, the language of physics. Physics, if you want to do physics, you need to know math. You can think abstractly, but to actually, you know, to actually do physics, to calculate various properties of nature and all, to solve problems, you need mathematics. You cannot do advanced physics without knowing advanced mathematics, unfortunately. All right. Um, okay, Infrand Zero says, do you think the Israel-Hamas conflict is a geopolitical move by China or Russia or Iran or maybe a combination to prevent the India, Middle East, uh, Europe economic corridor? Okay, let's let's consider this question. So, yeah, last year we had the G20 summit. Yes, we in India had the G20 summit in India, in New Delhi. And in during the summit, during the summit meeting, it was announced that India was, and, and so this, this trade corridor, economic and transport corridor was announced during the G20 summit. So it is, uh, it is, the intention is to connect India with Europe via the Middle East region, via Oman, Saudi Arabia, Israel, bypassing Turkey and going into Greece and further into Europe. And this would have transportation, this would have supply chains, this would have uh, trade and so on. And this uh, corridor has the blessings of the United States. And if it really happens indeed, then it will be a major challenge and a significantly viable alternative to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, One Belt, One Road. One belt to rule them all, one road to bind them. <laughs> so, you know, nations are pulling out of the BRI. You know, the, the Pakistan... Uh, the Pakistan phase of BRI, the CPEC, isn't working. Uh, Italy has pulled out of the BRI. Other nations are are beginning to see that it's not going to be good for them. So the IMEC, India, Middle East, Europe, Trade Corridor, it was supposed to be a great alternative to that. Now that this entire uh, region is kind of extremely tense, there is, there is a, you know, there is... A, there are hostilities happening over here. There's a conflict happening between Israel and Hamas, which could also involve Hezbollah, which is in southern Lebanon. And uh, so because of this conflict, the India-Middle East-Europe trade corridor is a non-starter for now. The Saudis wanted this to happen right away. They were saying that once the thing is announced, within 45 days, we should start creating, building the infrastructure. They really, really wanted this to happen, the Saudis. But then this thing this this conflict erupted out of nowhere last year in the last quarter of last year so the question is who benefits from this obviously china stands to benefit because the challenger to the bri isn't taking off right now it's kind of not happening yeah and we don't know when this conflict will subside so that we can start the project so yeah that definitely benefits china does it benefit russia Look, if China gets stronger economically and geopolitically, it's the Russians don't see it as a good thing. Okay, the major threat. See, Russia has two major threats. One obviously is the United States. The other major threat, just by looking at the map, it's clear that the major threat for Russia is China, this gigantic country, which is a very, very major economy, the second largest economy in the world, and a significant military power. So yeah, it's it's and, and the Russian Far East, you know. The Russian Far East, the Far East part of Russia is almost empty, very, very low population density. And when, when we look at the north east of China and the eastern part of China, its its population is quite dense, large population over here. So it's it's a threat for Russia. <clears throat> and since the Americans have been trying to isolate Russia, and since they have been trying to, you know, they've essentially unloaded all possible economic sanctions on Russia. There is a significant threat, a very real threat, that Russia could become overly dependent on China. And using my language, it could become a vassal of China. And for that reason, Russia wants India to get stronger vis-a-vis -vis China. And India for Russia is a pressure release wall when it comes to all these sanctions and also the Chinese threat. And you should also know that the Russians have ballistic missiles pointed at China. 
and the Chinese have ballistic missiles pointed at Russia. So what we are seeing right now is 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 a, a temporary kind of alliance. It it is it is a temporary cooperation and collaboration. But both nations know that their major threat right across the border is the other nation. So if the if the uh, IMEC doesn't take off and the Chinese BRI gets a, a fillip because of that, it gets bolstered, then it's not a good thing for Russia. So I don't think Russia would have made a move such as that, or they would have been, you know, enthused by what happened. Now, when it comes to Iran, um, Iran has, has its fingers in lots of pies in this region. They are a, a nation that has a significant appetite for taking risks. They are active beyond their territory in Iraq, which has a significant Shia population. They also have ties with Syria. They also have ties with Hezbollah and Hamas. They also have interests in Yemen and so on and so forth. They have a strategic alliance with China. The Chinese are investing roughly $400 billion in Iran in a strategic uh, deal, which is going to happen over the next 25 or so years. There is convergence between Iran and Russia as well. The Iranians have been supplying Russia with uh, uh, with suicide drones, loitering drones, loitering munitions that the Russians have been using in Ukraine. The Russians have been supplying Iran with uh, certain equipment, including fighter planes and, and other stuff as well. So there is all of this going on. Every nation has its own interests. Every nation has interests. Some nations, their interests converge and align to a certain extent, sometimes more significantly, sometimes less significantly. But every nation also regards other nations as adversaries also. So it's like, imagine a fish tank. Imagine a fish tank. Every fish wants to thrive. Some fish are big, some are small. So some fishes make alliances against bigger fish, smaller fish. Like 20 small fish will get together against the bigger fish. Some medium fish will get together for their own purpose and they will hunt the smaller fish and try to safe, safeguard themselves from the bigger fish and so on. So there is constant co cooperation as well as competition in the world. Okay, So I don't think this conflict benefits Russia. It does benefit Iran. It does benefit China, but definitely not Russia to that extent. That's how I see it. It's complicated. Now, who really triggered this conflict? Who set it off? Well, I, I think time will tell. I think time will tell. Okay. Ankur Singh says, your views on eight Indian ex-Navy officers released by Qatar. Once again, let's go to the map and find out where is the nation of Qatar. So once again, we go westwards from India. We cross the Sea of Saurashtra and we have the Arabian Peninsula. We cross Oman. We go westwards UAE. And there we have Qatar and Bahrain. So this little nation, Qatar, is the nation that had uh, held eight Indian ex-naval officers in prison. It had sentenced them to death for allegedly indulging in espionage on behalf of a third nation. Okay. And there was a situation for quite some time. And what now? What has now emerged is that Qatar has now released these eight Indian ex-Navy officers. And as far as I know, they have all been, at, le at least seven of them have been repatriated. I hope by now the eighth person has also been repatriated to India. So it was a significant reversal. You see, when, when a foreign nation takes eight of your citizens, puts them in prison, and sentences them to death. I think the best outcome you can hope for is that the death sentence will be revoked and they'll be given a long prison sentence. That's typically the best you can hope for. But what's happened here is that not only have the death sentences been revoked, they have all been freed and they've been rep repatriated to India. That is stupendous. That is a gigantic feat of diplomacy. It's a huge diplomatic win. And then... When was it? It was just a few days ago, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, it was just uh, like 10 days ago. Uh, Prime Minister Modi went, uh, visited the, the, the Middle East. He visited the UAE for the inauguration of the BAPS uh, Hindu Mandir, where I was there. I was there in the inauguration. And from there, he, he went to Oman and he met the leadership of Oman, the, the king or whoever, the, the, the 
crown prince or, or ruler of Oman. They hugged and they had a very cordial meet and he met all the all the principal government officials and the and India and Oman signed a, a very large deal for the supply of LNG, liquefied natural gas, to India at a discounted rate. So it's a win-win situation. Oman got this gigantic uh, deal with India. India got a big discount and India got its eight naval officers back, ex-naval officers back. I mean... Talk about win-win diplomacy. Everybody wins. Everybody goes back happy. And what the Indian government has done is we have essentially converted a potential enemy into a friend. I mean, I'm sure you all know there are no enemies and friends in geopolitics, but just using common parlance, common language, we have essentially converted a potential enemy into a friend. That, I mean, that is very high-level mature diplomacy. Very effective diplomacy. It's a, it's a huge, monumental win. It essentially surprised the entire world. So my view is that this is great. It's a great outcome for India. It's a great outcome for Oman. It's win-win diplomacy. Everybody goes back happy and everybody benefits from the outcome. I mean, what else can you ask for? I think it's it's great. Great job by, by India. Piyush Khattar says, why didn't why India doesn't have any base in Djibouti? Well, you could ask me, why doesn't India have a base in Greece? Or why doesn't India have a base in Singapore? I mean, India has military bases beyond its territory, but you can't expect to have bases everywhere, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, Djibouti, obviously, I mean, let's once again go back to the map. Djibouti is an interesting place. It's at the it's at it occupies a vital choke point, the Strait of Bab al Mandeb between between this the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea. So here's this little nation, Djibouti, in Africa. Okay, and as you can see, it it occupies a very vital, very strategic position geographically at the mouth of the Strait of Bab al Mandeb. You see Bab al Mandeb Strait, where the last out of Africa migration probably happened from. You know, humans crossed over from Africa across the Babel Mandeb Strait and eventually, about 70, 75,000 years ago, came into India and settled down here. So, Djibouti occupies this very important place and there are two nations that have bases in Djibouti. One is the US, the other is China. Would you like to see the bases? I can show you the bases. It, it's interesting viewing. So, we have Djibouti, the city of Djibouti here. Okay, now there over here we have an uh, international airport. Djibouti Ambuli, and uh, you have Camp Lemonnier USO. And let's take a look at the aircraft that are parked here. These are clearly US military aircraft. You have these large transportation aircraft. You have these, uh, you know, these swing wing helicopters. So you have a US presence here. You can see some more aircraft over here. These are all American aircraft, US aircraft. Well, that's not all. Let me show you something else. There is a different airstrip over here. I'm not sure you'll see something interesting here, but let's try and see if there is something. Oh, yeah. Now, check this out. What does this look like? This is one of those drones, Reaper, Predator, whatever you want to call it. So once again, you have a US base here. What else do we have? Well, there is this Chinese People's Liberation Army support base. So you have that here. They have their own little thing. And uh, yeah, this is a port that's used by the Chinese. So the Chinese and the Americans are, are uneasy bedfellows in Djibouti. Uh, so that's the situation in Djibouti. I hope it makes sense. Now, uh, now for India to come here, you would first of all have to negotiate with the government over here. And the Americans are already already unhappy about the Chinese presence there. They would definitely not want an Indian presence there. So we have we we as in India we have certain bases beyond our territory. I'll talk about the ones that everyone knows about. So there is Dukum, the port of Dukum. Okay, we have one here. Uh, is something visible? Hopefully not. I would say. So yeah, we have we have some some kind of presence apparently in Dukum. We also have a certain presence in the Indian Ocean region, uh, Seychelles, some presence uh, in uh, Mauritius. We have some presence here as well. Uh, 
where is it where is agalega okay i'll not go and look for it i'm sure you guys can check it out and then there is some presence um, let's say in tajikistan as well okay so we we have certain assets beyond our territory extraterritorial military bases this, that doesn't mean that we are occupying those nations we are doing that with their consent all right uh yeah so that's the deal with india what is the region of interest for us the region of our interest is the indian ocean region okay for that we need a uh, friends let's let's call it friends or or partners in this region one of the major partners for india is france because france has a significant presence in the indian ocean region see this french southern and Antar antarctic islands uh this again is is french territory here alfred de fore what is this here let me see marion research station south africa this is marion south africa and then the french also have reunion which is a french territory and then they have a presence in seychelles and so on so the french are a significant player in this region and it makes sense for us to partner with them so india and france have excellent relations because it makes sense for india and france to have excellent relations and then we have a partnership uh, in the the western indian ocean region the quad essentially which is not really a military alliance but a quasi military geopolitical kind of a partnership and uh, then we have good relations with all the nations in the eastern african region and we have good relations with the gulf nations the uae saudi arabia oman etc and we also have uh, we have chabahar and i'm sure there is some progress hopefully happening in chabahar so overall we are trying to secure our area of interest the indian ocean region djibouti well it's not that important for us as of now and later we will see as we grow and get larger and get more powerful will will i'm sure we will re rethink and revisit all of this okay let us see other questions I am not a Trojan horse says what's your opinion on Kerala I think Kerala is a fantastic place fantastic place great climate great people great history what else what else can you ask for I mean if you ask me for my for my general opinion I'll say Kerala is a fantastic place the people of Kerala are wonderful I love the climate in Kerala I love the weather love the love the culture love the architecture love the food what's not to love about the state just like all other in the other indian states very interesting very unique and a uh, place that people should visit uh <clears throat> aditya says when will polygamy ever be banned in india as this would interfere with the fundamental right to freedom because islamic texts allow to marry four wives at once well look it's a, it's it's a question for the government to decide i mean if you want to look at uh, if you, look, if you want to look at context and and precedents look at other islamic nations look at turkey for example do they have polygamy there no they don't is anyone complaining no one's complaining uh look at uh, extremely progressive nations like the uk and the us which have significant uh, muslim populations do they have polygamy no they don't have polygamy is anyone complaining there no one's complaining so i think it it's just common sense that uh, that it should not be a problem uh outlawing that practice in india but overall i would say it's for the government to decide it's not my perspective that matters it's the government's perspective and opinion that matters and I'll let them sort it out uh let us see let us see lucario says what would be your summary of the tucker and putin interview <laughs> a very interesting interview i haven't seen the whole of it but uh uh i am aware that mr putin first of all gave a 30 minute plus history lesson about the history of russia and and the whole region i remember just a couple of days before the ukraine war started in february 22 i did an emergency podcast with my friend ranveer alabadia we did it, did it uh, we recorded like this not in his place and he asked me about what the deal is and i gave a 30 minute i don't know 30 20 minute history lecture because you have to go back into history a thousand years or maybe more to understand the context if there is a problem today why does the problem exist how was it created you have to go back in history to understand that and what i saw is that tucker carlson was getting impatient he was trying to interrupt putin 
He was saying, come to the point. And Putin said, this is the point. You have to understand history. The point, one of the most interesting things one can see from this interaction is that the Americans have no sense of history. They're in the, how old is the US as a nation? 200 years, 300 years, whatever it is. 250, 270, whatever. 1700 something it was founded, right? Out of conquered territory. For them, 200 years is ancient history. For India, that's the day before yesterday. For us, a thousand years ago is the day before yesterday. For the Russians, history starts, their history essentially starts about 1200 years ago. I would go back 2000 years. And, well, the first mention of Slavic tribes by the Romans, uh, roughly 2000 years ago. But yeah, Putin chose to start about 11, 1200 years ago. It makes sense. In the, in the Westerners, especially the English-speaking people, they don't understand that. They have no sense of history, especially the Americans. The English, the British, they do have some sense of history. Their history goes back, what? 1,000 years? 2,000 years? They don't identify with, with, with the Picts and the Celts. They identify with the Angles and the Saxons. The Angles and the Saxons invaded the British Isles about 1,600 years ago, roughly 17. Look it up. They defeated the, the, the Celtic peoples and took over the place. And then the Normans invaded in the year 1066. William, Duke William of Normandy, who was called William the Bastard. But he conquered England, the last invader to successfully conquer England. And he then was over, over, forever known as William the Conqueror. So the British have some sense of history. The Americans don't. And they, Tucker just could not wait for the history lesson to get over. So. So it was interesting to see how well Vladimir Putin, President Putin, understands history. Okay, Every national leader should have a very good understanding of history and a great historic sense, a very strong sense of history. Because everything that we experience today, the, the way the world is, it is the consequence of it is it is the consequence of things that happened in the past. And we have problems in the world today. And to understand how to solve those problems, you have to understand how the problems were created in the first place. That's why history is important. To understand the cause and effect chain that created the world as it is today. So to undo historic mistakes, we have to first understand how the mistakes happened. So Putin gave a very, very good overview of the past, of the overall, of the overall history of the, of the Slavic people, of the Russian people, the Rus people. He demonstrated that Ukraine was nothing but the borderlands of Russia. The West doesn't want to acknowledge that, that historical fact, but there it is. And so on. So uh, I haven't seen the entire interview. It's a two hours, or seven or eight minute interview. But yeah, that's what I can give you as of now. That these people have no understanding or sense of history. What came across was that Putin is intellectually in a league of his own compared to most world leaders. There are very few who can come up to that level. He is extremely intelligent. And he can, I mean, Tucker Carlson was, was no match for Putin. Right. Let's see other questions. I agree. Putin's 30-minute history lesson was epic. Do I, like, do I like Star Wars? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love Star Wars. One of my earliest memories as a kid was going to a movie theater, big screen, and watching Star Wars. And I thought at that time, because I was like what, three years old, four years old, I thought Chewbacca was a gorilla. <laughs> and I remember the lightsabers and I remember Darth Vader. So yes, the original Star Wars trilogy was awesome. The first movie was great. The second was greater. The third wasn't bad either. And then they created three more movies, the prequels, which I haven't watched. I have seen The Revenge of the Sith, which was okay. And then you have all these new movies that have come out with God knows what characters. They've ruined the old characters. So the new movies, I am not a huge fan of. I've seen one or two, but uh, I can't remember anything about them. Kylo Ren and uh, what's that girl? That girl, I forget the girl's name. doesn't matter. Not important. So the first three movies, the original three movies were awesome. I like those. Yep. Big fan of movies, actually. Okay. Please tell about dark Indian education system. What's what's a dark education system? We have a very mediocre, very, very poor education system in India today. 
and I have spoken at great length about it. I have. So if you go, okay, let's let's uh, since we have this thing, let's check it out. Uh, let us go to uh, let's go and search on YouTube. Let's search for me, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is my channel, and uh, if we go to um, live. And you go back in time, go back, go back, go back, go back. Then I have three or four episodes only about education. Around 29, 30, ask a budget or something. Let's see, let's see where it is. Okay, so we have ask a budget 28, we have ask a budget 30, and ask a budget 31. Those three are the education focused episodes of Ask Abhijit. If you want to understand what's wrong with the Indian education system and what steps we need to take to, to improve it. Check out those three episodes. In detail, I have gone into all of that. Long time ago, maybe two years ago. But yes, if you want to understand about India's dark education system, check out those three episodes. All right. Let us... How do I start watching Star Wars? I suppose it should be available on some live... on some OTT platform. I don't know. Netflix, Prime, or Geo Cinema, or, or, or what Hotstar, or whatever it is, I suppose you will be able to find it somewhere. Karan says, if the sun has so much gravity, why doesn't the earth fall into it? Because the sun, the answer is, it's because the sun is not a vacuum cleaner. Okay? Uh, the universe follows certain laws, and the laws state that, well, there is something called orbits. So if 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 so if you shoot a bullet into the sky, okay, from the surface of the earth, it's gonna go up and it's gonna come down. But if you shoot the bullet with a certain amount of velocity, with a certain angle, it will go into orbit around the earth. It will keep on trying to fall to the earth, but never actually fall. Just keep on going around and round. And you have different kinds of orbits. You have elliptical orbits, you have polar orbits, you have all kinds of orbits, Lissajou orbits. Uh, I don't get go into that. So there is something called orbits. And the Earth and the other planets are in orbit around the Sun. I'm sure in the beginning of the solar system, when the whole uh, protostellar disk formed, lots of stuff would have fallen into the Sun after collisions and so on. But after everything settled down, after billions of years, the solar system is some four point something billion years old. So now it's stable. It has settled down over a long time. So now we have stable, more or less stable orbits of the different planets. Eventually, in the future, maybe a few billion years down the future, you may have more collisions between the planets and some other stuff may happen. But as of today, for all intents and purposes, we have a settled and stable solar system. So because of the laws of nature, the Earth doesn't fall into the sun. It simply goes around the sun in an elliptical orbit, as do all the other planets and other material in the solar system that we are aware of. It all goes around the sun in orbits. So that's just physics, orbital mechanics. You can check it out. I mean, you can maybe search some YouTube videos on orbital mechanics or find a textbook. So it's because of the laws of nature, but it's not falling into the, into the sun. Um, so this question... <laughs> I get all the time. How can India deal with the Pakistan problem permanently and gain land access to Afghanistan and Central Asia? For that to happen, my dear friends, the temporary nation would have to break up, right? And that nation, Pakistan, is forever on the brink of collapse, but it never collapses, right? So why does it not collapse? See, there are so many forces within Pakistan that 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 don't get along together. You have so many elements, ethnic elements, religious elements, linguistic elements, other elements that are pulling Pakistan apart in different directions. And still there is one entity, the Pakistan army and the ISI, that, that holds the nation together by force. Okay, The Sindhis would very much want independence from Pakistan. The Balochis would very, want, very much want independence from Pakistan. The Pashtuns in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province would very much want to be reunited with their brethren and sisterin in Gandhar, in Afghanistan. And Gilgit Baltistan and POK, etc. would very much want to reunify with their, their brethren across the border in India. So all these forces 
take Pakistan in different directions. But Pakistan is held together by force, by the ISI and the Pakistan army. And these are proxies of much more powerful forces. For the longest time, as we know, Pakistan bled India by doing terrorism, by exporting terrorism and terrorists into India. Happened for decades. And all of these terrorist activities were funded and financed by the United States. This is a fact. Then for some time, for a decade or so, Pakistan went into the Chinese embrace. They became Iron Brothers. And now Pakistan is back into the US embrace. So as long as other more powerful nations have an interest in Pakistan, that nation will exist. It's a temporary nation. But it will exist as long as it serves a certain purpose. What is the purpose for which Pakistan was created? The purpose was to counterbalance India, to keep India off balance, to keep on bleeding India. That was the purpose. And there are other purposes as well. To prevent, well, the great game from going forward in the 20th century and uh, to serve certain geopolitical interests of the West in the Gulf region as well. So all of that. So as long as this nation as value for the West, it's going to keep existing. And if the West loses interest, then, then the Chinese may find value in Pakistan. So to solve this problem permanently, India has to rise as a power. So if you, if you go through my geopolitics course, you will find that I, I calculate the actual power of each nation based on open source data, open source information, numbers, that are available in public. Based on numbers, you can calculate the exact power score that each nation has. So the US has a score of about 87 or something. Russia has a score of 50 something. China has a score of 15 or 16. India has a score of about four point something. Then you have France, then you have other nations. The top four nations are the US, which is a superpower. Then you have Russia, which is a near superpower. China, which is a great power. And India and France are middle powers. And then you have other nations. So for India to be able to solve this problem permanently, India will have to transform itself into a great power. And, you know, people believe that a nation's power depends on its GDP ranking, which is such an asinine thought. Okay, GDP does contribute to the score of a nation, power score, but there are lots of other factors that matter. GDP itself is nothing. There are other factors, more important factors that you have to take into consideration. So based on GDP, US is number one, Russia, China is number two, Russia is nowhere. India is number five. But based on actual power scores, the US is number one, Russia is number two, China is number three, India is number four, France is number five. So India's score is four, China's score is 15 or 16, US is 80, almost 90. So you can imagine the amount of influence in the US has as a global superpower on this region. So they are able to make Pakistan survive. For this problem to be solved permanently, India's national power score needs to go into the double digits, should become comparable to China. Then, even then, see, China still, even though it has a power score of, of about 15, it's not able to solve the Taiwan problem, which is in its own backyard. So India will have to rise much higher. Then we can solve the Pakistan problem. It's about rising as a nation, not just economically, but as a power, as a global geopolitical power, hard power, forget about soft power. Soft power is nothing in geopolitics. It's only hard power that matters. There are components of hard power. There is economic strength, there's military strength, there's nuclear strength, there's power projection. There is so much more that goes into the recipe for calculating a nation's power. So that's how India will eventually solve this problem by rising as a power, as a hard power, economic, military, nuclear, and other things as well. All of that has to has to contribute to India's rise. That's how India can solve this temporary problem. Uh, Aniket says, how to remove inferiority complex from oneself? That's a good question. You have to first, look, it's it's straightforward, but not easy, <laughs> okay? First of all, you have to start becoming honest with yourself. You need to understand what are your, you have to first understand yourself. You have to understand your strengths and weaknesses. Everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses. Nobody is excluded from this. 
you have to understand your strengths and weaknesses you have to understand what you want to achieve in life okay how do you know what you want to achieve in life picture yourself on your deathbed last day on the planet then ask yourself what do you want people to remember you for what do you truly truly want people to remember you for that's all you have to ask yourself that's your objective in life now come back to today and ask yourself where am i and where do i want to reach and the question is how do i get there now some people may not be able to figure out how to get there but the thing is every problem has been solved in the past there are only a, s- a small number of problems in the world okay but every time we try to reinvent the wheel in solving these problems so what you have to do is understand how such problems were solved in the past think of the people you admire okay think of the people you admire and ask yourself what has their journey been like where did they start from and where have they reached and how did they reach there and try to copy that formula and try to raise your standards the way to remove inferiority complex is to raise your standards first identify your strengths and weaknesses identify what weaknesses you want to remove and work on and understand it will not happen tomorrow or next week it will be it will be a long process give yourself 5 years but start working towards it and maybe you can create a dashboard a score or whatever and when you start seeing progress you feel better about yourself you start feeling better and you keep on working towards it consistently discipline hard work it's not easy but by doing that you will start feeling better about yourself you will start feeling confident and that's how you typically do it there is no shortcut and it's simple but very hard but you got to do it you have to do it you have to keep raising your standards the way to remove any inferiority complex is to raise your standards and work very very hard every day when you go to bed you should know that i work worked as hard as i could but not harder than that and and also work smart work hard work smart so that's how you do it by raising your standards and knowing that you are raising your standards okay um <clears throat> uh vinay wants long hair and hairstyle like me well do it i mean it's a passive thing just grow your hair stop stop getting a haircut and give you give yourself what a year year and a half you'll have long hair <laughs> that's it and tight behind you that's it done easy easy peasy all right <clears throat> uh Siddharth Singh Rajpur Hoyt says, what really happened in the Battle of Haldigati according to you? And sh- shed some light on the history and significance of Rajasthan. Well, there are two questions. Let's take one question. Let's talk about the Battle of Haldigati. So this was a battle between, who was it? Maharana Patap and the forces of the tyrant Akbar, Jalaluddin Akbar. Okay. And sadly, unfortunately, what by the time by the time Akbar was in power, he had captured a significant portion of India, a significant part of India, and turned various local kings into his vassals. And when you are a vassal, you have to do what is what your what your what your overlord tells you. So what happened was that the forces of this tyrant Akbar were led by Rajputs. Who was it? Man Singh was it or somebody? so you had a battle between two rajput forces but one rajput rajput force represented the tyrant the turk akbar and the other was maharana pratap so what were the objectives of the two sides what was akbar's objective jalaluddin akbar's objective what was maharana pratap's objective the objective of jalaluddin akbar was to defeat maharana pratap and either kill him and take his kingdom or defeat him and turn him into a vassal these were the objectives of the turkic forces the objective of the rajput forces maharana pratap forces the objective of maharana pratap was to remain independent not die and not become a vassal remain independent two different objectives one side wants to remain independent the other side wants to either destroy the enemy or turn him into a vassal two very different objectives now what happened there was a battle lasted a few hours lasted a day or whatever at the end of the battle what were the object what was the outcome at the end of the battle maharana pratap was still alive 
and he was still not a vassal of the Turks. So who achieved their objectives? Did the Turks, did, did Jalaluddin Akbar's forces achieve their objective of killing Marana Pratap or turning him into a vassal? They failed to achieve that objective. And Marana Pratap achieved his objective of staying alive and staying independent. So there you go, that's how it is. You, to understand the outcome of a battle or a war, you have to first analyze what are each side's objectives. And then see what was the outcome and who achieved their objectives. It's as simple as that. So from this very logical analysis, it's clear that the forces of Akbar failed to achieve their objective and the forces of Marana Pratap achieved their objective. That's how I see it. You may feel, you may, you are free to agree or disagree. That's not an issue. Uh, did you watch Society of the Snow? I have not watched it. It's about the plane, cr plane crash in the Andes Mountains, right? Uh, let's go to the maps. Map. Uh, where are the Andes? If, in case you are wondering, it's a mountain range. It's a mountain range in South America. So let's go to South America. And you have a mountain range in South America called the Andes. And it actually extends northwards and it becomes the Rocky Mountain Range in North America. So, okay. So I'm not sure it's, if it's visible from here, but uh, was it Chile? Was it Peru? I don't remember which part of South America it was, but what happened is that there was a football team, okay? A football team which was traveling in an airplane and this airplane crashes in the Andes Mountains, high up on the mountains where it's all frozen and snowy. Okay. And uh, the rescuers aren't able to locate the crash. Today we have GPS and stuff. We still lose planes, of course. But yeah, uh, the rescuers, the rescue operations were unable to locate the location of the crash. And these people, some of them survived. A, a large number of them survived. Some died. But they were stranded on, on the uh, Andes mountain range in extremely cold conditions, snowy conditions. And there was no rescue for, I don't know, months, I suppose. So they were left with a very horrible choice. How do we survive? There was no food source available. Water was there. You can melt snow and drink it, or you can just eat snow, which is not advisable. But yes, there, is, there was plentiful water from the snow. But there was no food. So they were left with a very horrible choice. What do we do to survive? And they resorted to cannibalizing the dead bodies. And that's how they survived. And eventually they were located after a long, long time. And there is a memorial up, up there on where the crash happened and so on. And, and I have not seen this movie, Society of the Snow, but I've seen a movie that came out about 20, 30 years ago, which was a good movie, pretty harrowing. So I've seen that. I don't remember the name of the movie. But yes, I've seen... An older movie, not the not the new one. Uh, Anisha says, "Will MBA be relevant in the next five years? As more and more IT professionals are losing their job and they are going for MBA." So that's a good question. What is MBA? Master in Business Administration. So you essentially become an administrator. You you gain the skills apparently that enable you to be an administrator of business or a manager of kinds of some of some kind you understand what a business is and what are the different components of business and how to manage it efficiently and administer it efficiently and so on so people with mbas typically get those middle management positions and eventually they can even rise to you know c s level c level uh, ranks you know ceo C, cfo coo etc so that's what an MBA apparently gives you. And there are some very good institutes in India, like the IIMs, etc. The one in Ahmedabad is supposed to be the best, is if I'm not mistaken. Uh, now, Anisha is saying that more and more IT professionals are losing their jobs and they're going for MBA. So listen, in any business, in any industry, you need a certain number of managers. But if you have seven times that number in the market looking for jobs, they will not there will, there will not be enough jobs for them. So yeah, MBA is, is something that's attractive. You get a good salary, I suppose, and you get good uh, job uh, 
positions and all. But if there are too many MBAs in the market, then there's going to be a surfeit, a surplus of MBAs, and then many of them will be jobless. The question is, why are these IT professionals losing their jobs? I suppose this is one of the reasons is the uh, is the emergence of artificial intelligence, AI. And uh, lots of coding jobs are going to AI. Today, people with no coding knowledge or experience can ask whatever AI tool they use to generate code for them and explain the code and, and make it run as well. So yeah, AI is going to bring a shift in the market. Lots of skills are going to get obsolete. Obviously, it doesn't make all coding, all programming obsolete. You will still need good programmers, but maybe less good programmers. Uh, and and it's gonna put lots of people out of out of business. Out of, and people have to re, will will have to reskill themselves. And the solution is not to go and get an MBA. The solution is to go and get skills that cannot be replaced. So uh, I don't know. See, eventually these degrees will they will not be worth a lot. The way I see it. I mean, if you look at the education system overall, we have all the in the take the Indian education system as an example. If you want to get a good job, you need to have a master's degree. And typically it doesn't matter what master's degree you have. You can have a master's degree in English literature. And as long as you have a master's degree, you'll be eligible to apply for a certain kind of job. And then the question is: what skills did you gain from that master's degree or bachelor's degree or whatever it is? These degrees, they simply waste your time, most of them. And they don't give the skills you need to start performing in a certain job or industry. Typically, what happens is, for example, if you want to go into IT, you come with some degree. And then your company, whichever company hires you, is if you're a fresher, they're going to have to train you from scratch. Train you from scratch. They're going to have to teach you how to start a computer. These days, you don't need those skills. But how to do Hello World programming and go on from there. Ideally, you want to have students who come out with those skills ready to you know hit the ground running uh, so eventually i think only skills will matter not degrees and your resume is gonna be your portfolio what stuff have you already created during your time as a student for example if you're into websites how many websites did you code or design or create towards the websites if you are some into something else what other code did you create or what 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 Things you deploy and so on and so forth. So that your your portfolio is gonna be a resume. So for example, if I were hiring, okay, I would not care what degree you have. I would only care what skills you have, and your skills have to be demonstrable. I would ask you to sh uh, show me what what uh, what you have created over the past uh, I don't know year two years during your your internship as a student or whatever it is i would like to see what you are capable of creating and contributing i don't care what degree you have and even in the us there are lots of companies that no longer care about degrees they only do extensive interviews and they see actually what skills you have i think eventually india always lags behind in these things when the us does something 5 or 10 years later india starts doing that thing so i think it's going to happen eventually in india as well people will not care about your degree they will just care about your skills um so eventually degrees will become irrelevant and obsolete and maybe you will have different kinds of different kind of education you know nowadays we are moving towards uh, open textbook exams and all that which is a good move I, I would say because it doesn't you know whatever you can refer to immediately doesn't matter so i think eventually all degrees will become more or less irrelevant and obsolete uh, not just the mba but other, other stuff but maybe there are certain things that are taught in mbas that actually are skills that are worth having. So maybe if you do an MBA from a really good institution, it may be still relevant. But hopefully. Yeah. All right. She by sub CCP Wale asks, who were the Huns? What was their origin? So the Huns, well, the name, the Huns comes from ancient India. We used to call those people, they were invaders. We used to call them Shweta Hunas. And they attempted to invade India during the reign of the Gupta Empire, the Gupta dynasty. The Gupta dynasty emerged out of Magadh. Their original cap capital was Patliputra. And from there they moved to, I believe, uh, where was it? Ujjain? 
I, I can't recall, but you can look it up. So during the reign of the Gupta Empire, the Gupta dynasty, which was a golden age for India, the whole of India more or less was once again politically unified. At that time, these, these marauders, these, these uh, nomadic invaders unleashed wave upon wave upon wave of invasion on India. And our emperor Skanda Gupta, he repelled wave after wave after wave of Hunnic invasion. He, he swore an oath that I will not eat in a from a plate and I will not sleep in a bed until I defeat the invaders and throw them out of my country. I will eat food from a, from a leaf and I will sleep on the floor until I achieve this. And he achieved that. Great guy, Skanda Gupta, great defender of India. So these Huns, what was their origin? Their origin was more or less where we have Mongolia today, in this region, in Mongolia, Inner Mongolia. And the Chinese called these uh, nomads, they called them the Xionyu, S-I-O-N-G-N-U or something like that. Okay, So they emerged from this region. The Huns and the Mongols essentially had similar origins. Maybe they were the same uh, ethnic stock. And the Huns then spread westwards. They expanded westwards. The westward expansion of the Huns, it, uh, it dislodged the Kushans from, from this, the eastern part of Central Asia. And the Kushans started fleeing westwards. And because of the westward fleeing of the Kushans, the Scythians started fleeing southwards. And they invaded India as a consequence. So you had the Scythian invasion of India. The Scythians assimilated into Indian society very harmoniously. Today we don't know who has Scythian ancestry, who has not. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But northern western India, India, you have people with a significant amount of Indo-Scythian ancestry. And the Scythians themselves were of Indian origin, by the way. So that's a whole different story. The Kushans too. Then the Kushans invaded India and you had the Kushan Empire. Tanishka was one of our greatest kings who did more than most kings could ever do in their lifetime for Indian culture and the Indian national interest, Kanishka. And then during the Gupta era, you had the Hunnic invasions of India and the Huns tried, the, tried invading India at the same time that they were invading the Roman Empire. So you can see how widespread they were, the Huns. Okay. So uh, they were defeated repeatedly by Skanda Gupta but after the downfall of the Gupta era, of the, of the Gupta dynasty, the Huns did make significant inroads into India. They first conquered the Gandhara, the Gandhara region, the northwest of India. Uh, I believe one of their kings, one of the Hunnic kings built the Buddhas in Bamiyan. Okay, most likely. And then you had kings like, uh, what was his name? Mihir Kul who was hated by all because he was an adharmic person. He persecuted the, the Brahmins, he persecuted the Buddhists, he persecuted everybody. So Mihirkul was, was a very adharmic king. Nobody liked him. Everybody remembered him with bitterness. But then there were good Hunnic kings as well. So uh, they established the Kabul Shahi, Hindu Shahi dynasty in Kandara, and they defeated, they, they defended India from the Turks for a significant amount of time. And then you had other Hunnic kings who settled down in various parts of India, including all the way in Rajasthan and northern Gujarat as well, and so on. So they were, so to once again make a long story short, the Huns were nomads. They were uh, they they spread across the whole of Eurasia. They tried invading India at the same time that they were in, tried to invade the Roman Empire. They were defeated by the Gupta Emperor in India, Skanda Gupta, but they defeated Rome. Okay, they had significant success in invading Rome, and they eventually made inroads into India, and they also settled down in India and assimilated into Indian society. And once again, today, if you go to northern India, you will have people with some Hunnic ancestry. And they won't even know about it. And they won't care because it doesn't matter. So, yeah, that's about the Huns. The Shweta Hunas. Um, okay, Compact 786 says, How likely is it for NATO nations to invade the Republic of Iran in order to disturb the trade routes for Russia? Interesting hypothetical question. Let's take a look at the map. 
So we're talking about an invasion of Iran, Persia. So as you can see, Iran is located west of India. I mean, you know, you know what I mean. Okay. So the question is, how does one, how does a major power, let's say NATO, invade a nation like Iran? So for example, let's talk about their previous invasion in the region, which was the invasion of Iraq. So NATO, which is essentially the US, it completely changed the balance of power in the Middle East region, in West Asia, in a first in 1991 to a certain extent, and then in 2003 to a complete extent. By In 2003, they invaded Iraq and destroyed the government of Iraq. And uh, they destroyed the nation as well, and then they imposed a puppet government there, which kind of still continues. The Iraqi government today has been requesting the Americans to please leave the country, but they refuse to leave. <laughs> okay, so how did they invade Iraq? First of all, in 91, how did the Americans invade Iraq? They assembled a significantly large, very large multinational force, coalition, inv invasive, invasive coalition of nations, which was mostly led by them only. And the invasion was launched from various nations, from the Persian Gulf, from Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. And they started with a very heavy aerial bombardment of the nation, which kind of killed God knows how many people, and weakened the, the regime of Saddam Hussein. And then they left. Then they returned in 2003, and they finished the job. George W. Bush finished the job that his father had started. So to do this, so now to invade Iran, it's a whole different story. First of all, in Iran has strong allies in Russia and in China. And Russia is not really that far away. Russia is right north of Iran if you cross the Caspian Sea. And uh, nations like Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, etc. are, you could say, nations that are very much Russian proxies or vassals to a significant extent. None of these nations can go against Russia. They are in the Russian zone of influence, sphere of influence. So Russia has access to Iran via the Caspian Sea and also via these nations, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, etc. Even a nation like Azerbaijan could be used by Russia to uh, support Iran. Possibly. That's a possibility. Now to invade Iran, the Americans or NATO, let's say NATO, would need to do it via the Gulf of Oman or the Persian Gulf, which is very difficult, or from the Saudi Peninsula, which would open up Saudi Arabia or the Gulf nations to Iranian retaliation. Now, understand this. The NATO countries, now understand this, forget the map for now. The NATO nations have been supplying Ukraine with arms and ammunition in the proxy war against Russia, which was started by the Russians in February 2022. So I'll not go into the history of the Ukraine war, but the Americans and the NATO nations have been supplying an endless stream of arms and ammunition to Ukraine. What that tells you is that the amount of arms and ammunition that are available with NATO are at possibly an all-time low, especially ammunition. Bullets, artillery shells, missiles, rockets, whatever else. They have been supplying this to Ukraine. So they are running low on all these things. Okay, Iran has been a nation at peace for a very long time. They have been hit by a tremendous amount of sanctions by the Americans, sure. But they have not been at war with anyone for a long time. And they have a good defense industry. And they have good supplies from Russia. Russia is open to giving them supplies. So the Iranians have significant ballistic missile capabilities. They are very good at producing drones. And all the and all the US bases, military bases, etc., in the uh, Gulf region, in the Middle East region, are very much within range of Iranian missiles, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones, whatever. The Iranians are able to supply Yemen, the Houthis, the Ansar Allah faction in Yemen, mm -hmm. with drones and other ammunition and other weapons, which is uh, enabling them to kind of blockade the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb, because of which all the global supply chains are now having to pass through the 
<laughs> South of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. You know, there's piracy also happening from Somalia at the same time. So Iran is able to supply Yemen, the Ansar Allah faction in Yemen, with arms and ammunition. They have their hands in Iraq as well. They're able to have a good alliance, an effective alliance with Hamas and Hezbollah as well. So they are a nation that is has a significant appetite for taking risks. They have a very good defense industry. They have a tremendous amount, I'm sure, of arms and ammunition. It's not going to be easy to invade Iran. If, if, if NATO tries to invade Iran, they may end up losing possibly many of their bases in the Middle East region. It's not going to be easy. And especially if Russia gets involved. So when the Americans tried to take out Syria, Syria almost fell. I mean, the ISIS or whatever forces were on the on the outskirts of Damascus, Damascus. And then the Russians stepped in and saved Syria. So the Russians could do the same in Iran, I'm sure. So it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be like Iraq, like the invasion of Iraq. It's going to be a whole different ballgame if NATO wants to invade Iran. And if it doesn't go the way they want it to go, then it will be a huge, huge blow to their credibility. So I don't think it's a risk they want to take right now. I don't think the Americans are open to taking a, such a risk at this point in time. So yeah, it's not going to be easy if they do want to do that. All right. <clears throat> Gaurang Mathur says, is India going towards dictatorship? I mean, what? <laughs> Who's telling you that India is going towards dictatorship? We have an election coming up in a, in a couple of months. National election. We have elections every, every few months in, across the various states of India. India is a very active democracy. It's a very chaotic democracy. We have hundreds of political parties in India. Where is the dictatorship? If people vote for a certain leader and keep voting for the leader, it doesn't mean that India has become a dictatorship. What do you mean by dictatorship? What's the, the definition of dictatorship? A dictatorship is a nation in which you have a single political party and, and that party decides who will rule you. That's a dictatorship. China, North Korea, and in certain nations you have two political parties. Two political parties, not one, two. It is one step above North Korea and China. A nation like the US. And it doesn't matter who comes to power, they have the same foreign policy. That's a dictatorship. In India, if a new party comes to power, the foreign policy will take a 180 degree turn. That's not a dictatorship. This is a democracy. Now, let's say, let's say hypothetically, India is going towards a dictatorship. Is that such a bad thing? Think back to the times in India's history when India was very prosperous and very powerful. The Mauryan Empire, the, Gup, the, the, the Kushan Empire, the Gupta Empire, the Chola Empire, the Maratha Empire. That's when India was at its, at its peak. Was the, were those democracies? Those were monarchies. Those were dictatorships. But that's when India did the best, historically. Was, was Lord Krishna a democrat or a dictator? He was king of Dwarka. Did he become king of Dwarka through an election? Was Lord Rama elected by the people? So my point is, what really matters for a nation is long-term security and prosperity, self-determination good living standards, and a long-term good future for your descendants. That's what matters. The type of political system doesn't really matter. Actually, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. You want good outcomes. It doesn't matter how you achieve those good outcomes. Dictatorship, democracy, whatever. And India is not going towards dictatorship. I, I, dictatorship. I don't know where these ideas come from, really. But yeah, it's good to see that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, let's see some of the questions. 
Kostub says, was Hamas aware that Israel is a nuclear state and can use nukes if needed? Everyone knows Israel is a nuclear state. Uh, it's well known that Israel has a nuclear weapons program that was disclosed. That was that was that was leaked in the 1970s or 80s by a guy called Mordechai Vanunu. So Mar- Mordechai Vanunu was a. Uh, you want to see something? <laughs> I can show you something. So let us go to Israel. Okay, let's open the satellite image. This is Israel, and uh, let us go towards Be'er Shiva. And there is a place called Dimona. Yes, Dimona. Now near Dimona, not in the city of Dimona, but somewhere nearby, there is this. Uh, is this the one? Let me see. Now this is a fertilizer plant. Is it? Well, there's got to be something else. Timona. Is it here? Uh, <laughs> Beersheba. I'm sure it's somewhere here. Ah, here we have it. The Negev Nuclear Research Center. And you can see this dome over here. The coolant dome of a nuclear reactor. So, This individual, this guy, Mordechai Vanunu, was a technician over here. And he surreptitiously took images of what was happening inside. And then he leaked it to, I believe, a British publication called News of the World or something like that. And that's how the world came to know that the Israelis had nuclear capabilities and they had nuclear weapons. So I think it's a well-known fact that Israel is a nuclear weapons power. It is believed to have something like 80 to 100 nuclear warheads, which it can use. So the whole world knows this. It's not something new. Hamas obviously knows that Israel is a nuclear weapon state. It doesn't matter. You know, nuclear weapons come into play when you have two powers fighting each other and one power is on the brink of of, of collapse or, or or going out of existence. That's when nuclear weapons come in, in, come into play, into force. You cross, when you have a nuclear weapons power, a nation, and you cross certain red lines for them, that's when they can retaliate with nuclear weapons. But you can't use nuclear weapons against terrorists. Think about it logically. Let me give you a different example. In our own neighborhood, we have a temporary nation, Pakistan, we have Afghanistan. Pakistan, we know, is a nuclear weapons power. It has a number of nuclear weapons. The Afghans have no nuclear weapons. But the entire Afghanistan-Pakistan border is active. There are military clashes happening every day. The Pashtun nationalists, that are the Taliban, they do not recognize the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, the Duran line. and They want large parts of Pakistan back in Afghanistan. So the, the Pakistanis have a huge border dispute with Afghanistan. And there are daily military clashes. The Pakistanis have even done airstrikes in Afghanistan. But there's no point threatening the Taliban with nuclear weapons. The Taliban are not a nuclear weapons power. Afghanistan is sparsely populated. And it's a war crime to use nuclear weapons against civilians. You understand? So even though Pakistan is a nuclear weapons power, those nuclear weapons are pointless when it comes to combating Afghanistan. They may come on to play with Iran. Okay, Iran these days has been uh, quite active vis-a-vis Pakistan. Surgical strikes, latest news we heard. So similarly, when it comes to Israel, the state of Israel against a terrorist outfit like Hamas, there's no point talking about nuclear weapons. You have to deal with them in a different way. This is asymmetric warfare that we're talking about. So uh, Israel is in no position to use nukes against Hamas. The entire world would turn against Israel if it does that. Why does Israel have nukes? It has nukes as a last resort, the Samson option. Israel is in a very bad neighborhood. It has, you know, its neighbors have gone to war with it multiple times. So the purpose of the Israeli nuclear weapons is that if all the neighbors of Israel 
come together and invade Israel, and Israel is on the brink of being destroyed, then Israel will destroy all its neighbors before it is destroyed. That is the Samson option. That's why Israel has nuclear weapons. They're not, they have not been developed to use them against terrorists. Okay. Red Chili says, Mera question, Kabito Lobai. Okay, what's your question, sir? I, I see you have to make your question visible. I took this, but you, there is no question here. So, yeah, ask a question. Maybe I'll notice it. There are, see, there are hundreds of questions coming every few minutes. So, please be patient. All right, let's see something else. Uh, let us see some other questions. Uh, okay, let's see this. Yash Kapoor says, Please tell us how we can solve the issue of illegal immigrants coming to India, not from not only from Bangladesh, but also Nepal and other neighboring countries. Look, Nepal is not an issue. If, if people come into India from Nepal, first of all, the Nepalese citizens have the right to come into India. That's not illegal immigration. Every Nepalese citizen has the right to come to India, live in India, work in India, do whatever they want. The only thing is that they cannot vote in India. They can serve in the arm, Indian armed forces. We are we have an open border with Nepal. There is no issue with Nepalese citizens. No issue at all. So I welcome Nepalese to come to India if they want to. The issue is not Nepal. The issue is nations like Bangladesh and increasingly Myanmar, Burma. Now, Burma is a friendly nation actually. They are the same culture as us. But the problem is the, the certain parts of Burma are, are not no longer under government control. And the tribal groups that live in northern and western Burma are not even Burmese. They don't speak the Burmese language. They don't practice Burmese culture. They don't respect Burmese culture or the Burmese language or the nation of Burma. One, well, the group that we are talking about, obviously, is the cookies, the so-called cookies. They are fighting against India. They are fighting against Burma. They are fighting against Bangladesh. Three nations. And they have been pouring into Manipur in lakhs. And they've completely changed the demographics of Manipur. Completely, totally. And this situation was created by the post-independence governments of India, who kept the border open, okay, and who allowed these people to come in, just keep coming in, keep coming in. And then the Modi government inherits this disaster. So it's a situation that has happened over a century, roughly. It's going to take time. So the first thing we have to do is to start fencing the border. And it's, it's easier said than done. Take a look at this border. It's all hills and mountains and forests. It's going to take years and years and years to, to fence this border. And then there is the issue of Mizoram, which I will not go into. Okay, I'll not go into the issue of Mizoram, which is an even bigger headache for India. So this entire border will have to be fenced. Can you see the size of the border? How big it is? It's completely open. Okay? This should have been fenced in the 1950s. So now there are all kinds of issues with that. And then we have the issue of with Bangladesh. Now, tell me, we have a proper fencing done with Bangladesh. And still there are all, not everywhere, but to a large extent. But still there are Bangladeshis who keep pouring into India. Now, why is this happening? Clearly, there is corruption at various levels. In, cert in certain states, perhaps. In certain... Border security agencies, perhaps. I'm just saying perhaps. Okay. So these things will have to be tackled by the government of India. These are deep-rooted problems that have been around for decades. These problems have been around for decades. And it will take some time to solve them. So we have to fence all the borders. And we have to place the right kind of border personnel on the borders. Not the kind of personnel who will take a, a thousand rupee bribe from a Bangladeshi and take a lot of Bangladeshi into India. I'm just saying. So these things take time. These are not easy solutions. You can't just flip a switch and make everything right. It takes time. So these problems have been created by the past governments of India. Useless. I don't have words to, to express my frustration. How lightly they, they have taken national security. They have played with national security and the integrity 
territorial and demographic integrity of India. So yeah, this is a huge problem. We we acknowledge the problem exists, and we're going to have to solve it, one way or the other. All right. Uh, let us see some other questions. Uh, Shubham Pawar says, what do you think of India's cut in UN funds? Will it make any pressure on UN countries or five permanent security council members? Give a view, give us a view of India and five permanent security members. So there is something called the UN Security Council, which has five permanent members and a whole bunch of other nations that are voted in and out. Okay. I'll not go into the process of how it happens, but there are five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Who are these members? The US, the UK, France. China and Russia. So it used to be the USSR. Now it's Russia. They wanted their India to be there, but Mr. Nehru kept refusing. So then they brought China in. Okay. And then you have France and the UK. So this constitution of the UN Security Council represents the winning alliance of 1945. At the end of the Second World, War, World War, the winning alliance was essentially these nations. China was not there, it came in later, but it was still on the side of the Americans at that time, at that point in time. So the composition of the UN Security Council, which is a veto-wielding body, each member has a veto, the composition reflects the reality of 1945 and the global geopolitical situation of 1945. Today we are in 2024. This happened almost a, a hundred years ago, almost a century ago. It does not by any means represent today's ground realities. And yet these veto-wielding members of the UN Security Council are entrenched in there. They are holding on to this little power that they have. It gives them not a little power, but a great amount of power and a great amount of influence. Now, today, the world's most populous nation, one of the most powerful nations in the world, is not a member of the UN Security Council. So it doesn't make any sense. But clearly. Something has to be done. And, it, you know, the Security Council will not reform itself. It won't happen by, on its own. We're going to have to pressurize it. The main thing is, from India's perspective, India needs to become more powerful. India needs to keep on working on its economic growth, its overall growth in terms of power. And there will come a time... When India will be so large, so economically powerful and militarily powerful, overall powerful, that the UN Security Council membership will become irrelevant. Because power has a language of its own. Power exerts pressure, pressure externally. So once you are at a certain stage, at a certain level, then whether you are a member or not of the UN Security Council becomes irrelevant because you can anyway get your way, make your way in the world the way you want it. So, but as of now, India is not that powerful. <laughs> India, in, India is slightly above France in terms of geopolitical hard power and much below China. Okay. So as of today, all India can do is, is India can play the long game. How does India play the long game? You keep on repeating in global forums that the UN Security Council needs to be reformed. You keep on saying it over and over and over again. And the more you grow and the more you matter, the more people will have to be forced to hear you. And eventually it will have some effect, maybe 20 years down the line. So India is playing the long game. But right now what India has done is India has... So every nation, every member of the UN, typically contributes some funds to the UN. Some nations contribute more funds, some nations contribute uh, soldiers to the UN peacekeeping forces and so on and so forth. And India has been one of the major contributors to the UN peacekeeping forces in terms of soldiers, manpower. And India is also one of the major funders of the UN. So we have now uh, cut the funding substantially. Because what's the point in keeping on funding this organization that is kind of, you know, to a certain extent, corrupt, 
and to a certain extent it doesn't reflect today's realities and it it just exists as a as a tool of other more powerful nations in the hands of other more powerful nations it doesn't serve the global interest it is not a fair and impartial organization so because of these reasons it doesn't make sense for india to keep funding it to that extent that's why we have cut the funding and we are keeping on applying the pressure and keeping on saying that the un security council needs to be reformed the un as an organization as an institution itself needs to be fundamentally reformed that's what we are doing and that is a righteous and just cause okay <clears throat> Chetan says, how might the global landscape change if nuclear weapons were rendered obsolete? It would totally transform the global landscape. It would make Russia lose a significant amount of its geopolitical power. You see, today, Russia's economy isn't doing great. It's, I think it's not even in the top 10 from the GDP perspective. Russia is an autarky. An autarky, what's an autarky? An autarky is a nation... It's, it's a nation that is self-sufficient in all fundamental aspects, in terms of energy, coal, gas, oil, all of that, in terms of food production, agricultural production, in terms of fertilizer, in terms of raw materials, everything that you can think of, Russia is completely self-sufficient. So Russia is the only nation, large nation in the world, that is a genuine autarky. So that is a plus point from Russia's perspective, a significant plus point. But from a global hard power perspective, much of its hard power comes from its enormous nuclear weapons arsenal. Russia has the world's largest arsenal of nuclear warheads, nuclear weapons, and delivery systems. So a significant amount of its hard power comes from that. If those disappear, Russia will be open to all kinds of attack. The one thing that's holding the US back, and possibly also China, is the danger that Russia's nuclear weapons pose. Nobody wants to cross that line when it comes to Russia. Russia is that capable. It can annihilate anyone. I mean, it doesn't want to, but it's there. So if nuclear weapons were rendered obsolete, it would take away a significant portion of Russia's power, significant portion of America's power as well. It would completely transform the global geopolitical power landscape. Completely transform, transform it. And then other things would come to the fore. Things like your, your conventional power, your economic power, your energy self-sufficiency, your uh, power projection, and so many other things. Those things would become more, uh, more important. So yeah, if you were to make these weapons obsolete, it would totally transform the global geopolitical landscape. Okay. Um... Giuseppe Di Fraia says, Geopolitics is a blood sport with no friends and just temporary alliances. Dog eats dog with no mercy and complete ruthless tactics to achieve goals. Geopolitics is murder and killing. Well, you can have rules. You know, we live in the so-called rules-based world order, which means that the rules and the order are made by the most powerful nation, the US, and everybody else just plays along. And the Americans can change the rules anytime they want, and they keep on doing that. But as long as you play by their rules, they will tolerate you and let you survive. So it's not about completely about murder and killing. There is a certain amount of that. I mean, whenever the Americans invade a nation, it's not pretty. They essentially flatten entire nations. Uh, so yeah, uh, no friends, I agree. And there are temporary alliances. It's certain uh, Certain alliances are more long-lasting. When two nations don't have a common border, are significantly apart geographically, and they have a significant convergence of interests, then those alliances can be very long-lasting alliances. So some alliances are more transactional, some alliances are more temporary, some alliances are very long-lasting, some alliances are, are almost friendly, especially when the cultures are similar, then you can have actual friendship. You know, when, when there is people-to-people -people warmth, then can act, there can actually be friendship on a people-to-people -people, people level. And when there is cultural alignment, there is a more closer kind of relationship. But yes, at the end of the day, it's about self-interest first. Uh, sometimes it can be a blood sport, as we have seen so many times in history. So overall, I, I agree with this. Overall, I agree. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Srinivas Sunil says, why does the IMF keep bailing out Pakistan given its track record? What is the real purpose of IMF? The real purpose of the IMF and the World Bank and all these global bodies is to do the bidding of their master. These are not impartial, benevolent organizations. What world are you living in, dear sir? <laughs> do you think the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund exist to help out the poor and disadvantaged people of the world and to help out poor nations? These organizations exist to serve their masters. These organizations were created by certain powers. These organizations, first of all, where is the IMF located? Let's let's try and Google this. IMF headquarters, shall we? Let's let's try and Google IMF headquarters. Where is it located? IMF headquarters. It is Washington, DC, United States. Oh my god, what a big surprise. What about World Bank? Let's see World Bank. World Bank headquarters. <gasps> oh, Washington, DC, United States. Oh my god, oh my god. What about the United Nations? Headquarters, Midtown, Manhattan, New York City, US. Do you get the point? Do you get the point? See, the world that we see is a world of Maya. It's a make-believe world. You, if you, if you watch, a, you know, a TV newsreader, they're gonna paint a certain picture of the world. If you watch various, listen to various analysts, they'll paint a certain picture of the world. The real world is different. The real, to understand the real world, you have to go. You have to go several layers deep and understand each of these organizations, how it was created, when was it created, who created it, whose interest it serves, what policies does it implement, and so on. You have to go deep into all these things to understand the true purpose of an organization. When the IMF gives a loan to a nation, they don't simply give money to the nation. They also tell the nation how to use the money, how it will be used and how it will not be used. You become a puppet once you get involved with the World Bank and the IMF. So when you have the IMF bailing out Pakistan over and over again, it tells you that Pakistan plays a significant role in the service of the United States of America. Now I hope that makes it clear why the IMF keeps bailing out Pakistan. Because Pakistan is a is an important tool, it's an important asset that the US has. What is the purpose of Pakistan? It's to keep India under check and to keep dangling that sword over India's head that you have this ro rogue nation, the US, and they have nukes, that sort of thing. Please understand, that's, that's how the world works in, in the real world. That's how it works. Okay. Krish Agarwal says, do you think, can China start a war with India at any moment? What are its geopolitical angles? Look, it's a good question. Yes, we, we should certainly take this question. So let's uh, take a look once again at the map. Where is China? Where is India? So today you have India and China sharing a, sharing a border, a common border. Historically, see, China has existed for what, how long? 3,000 years? Three and a half thousand years, if you want to be nice to them, India and China never had a common border. We always had this nation of Tibet in, in, in the Central Asian region. And China was east of the so-called Great Wall of China, which is way, way, way further east from where China today is. So India and China never had any issues because of that. After the 1950s, when Mr. Nehru, the great, magnificent Mr. Nehru, allowed the Chinese to take over Tibet, we have this issue this problem, this undemarcated border and this common border. When two major giant nations have a common border, there's going to be problems. And China is currently, please understand, more powerful, significantly more powerful than India. China is three to four times more powerful than India right now. The only thing that's holding China back, okay, from a realistic perspective, is the prospect of Indian nuclear weapons. The Chinese have spent decades building up their economic power. And if they cross certain red lines of India, they stand to lose everything. 
So because of that, that's one factor. And the other factor is the incredibly inhospitable terrain of the Himalayan region. Extremely inhospitable, inhospitable terrain. Very, very high altitude terrain. It's hard to just stand and breathe there. I've been there. I've reported from there. You can see some videos. It's really, really hard to be there, to just walk there. It's almost impossible to fight hand to hand. And the terrain is such that you can't do conventional warfare. You have to do hand to hand fighting often. You can't, it's very inhospitable for armored vehicles. It's very hard for tanks to exist in this terrain. Uh, it's hard for the Chinese to, to you know, have planes, fighter planes take off from Tibet because it's such high altitude and so on. They can take off, but they will have to carry a lower, lighter payload and less arms and ammunition and so on. So because of all these factors, it doesn't make sense for China to start a war with India. They can certainly use proxies like the disaster situation in Burma to destabilize India. They can certainly use a nation like Pakistan against India. They can meddle in the affairs of internal affairs of Nepal. They can meddle in the internal affairs of the Maldives. They can try to, you know, coerce Bangladesh, or they can try to do the debt trap diplomacy with Sri Lanka. They can keep on doing this, but it doesn't make sense for them, if they have any, any sense, to start a war with India. Okay, it could end up being a complete disaster for China. And China is a different kind of country. It's not a democratic nation, it's a dictatorship. In China, they don't tolerate a leader who loses. If you lose a war, if you end up starting a war that humiliates your nation by not achieving the objectives, then you will be thrown out of power and you will disappear into nothingness. You will be instantaneously ousted in a coup. Or, or worse. So, because of all these factors, it doesn't make sense for China to start a war with India at this moment or any moment. And India is only getting more and more powerful. You wait a decade, it will be a different kind of India. You wait two decades, it will be a whole different India. And China is staring down at a demographic disaster. The, the falling birth rates, the falling falling TFR, the contracting economy, it's not going to be good for China this, this century. It's not the Chinese century. Yeah, so that's the deal. So it doesn't make sense from a realistic perspective for China to start a war with India. Obviously, China would want India to disintegrate. The only nation in Eurasia, apart from Russia, that China is concerned about, that China fears in the long run, is India. China has three major adversaries, the US, Russia, and India. And India and Russia are kind of on the same page. Russia very wants, very much wants India to get more, grow more powerful, because India is by no means a threat for Russia, but India is a great counterbalance towards for China, from the Russian perspective, and from the American perspective as well. It is so strange that Russia and America agree about India from this perspective. So it's a complex situation, but overall, I would say it doesn't make sense for China to start a war with, war with India. It would be, it can end up as a Tremendous disaster for China. All right. Um, <laughs> Firefly YT says, what do you think happened to D.B. Cooper? So this was sometime in the 60s, 70s, 50s. I don't remember which decade, but there was this guy in the US. I think in the 70s. 70s, was it? Shall we just Google it? So this guy jumped off a plane. And apparently survived. So let's uh, go to Google, our friend Google. D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper. So which year was this? 1971 it was. Okay, so this gentleman, he boards an aircraft. Okay, he boards an aircraft and uh, in the US, a commercial passenger plane. And in the middle of the plane, I think he, he has stolen some money. He's got a whole bunch of cash apparently. And he asks one of the air hostesses, he, he hijacks the plane, he has all the passengers disembark from some, some airport, then he takes the plane off again into the air, he obviously tells the pilots to take off. And then at some point in time, he goes to the back door, in those days, one of this aircraft used to have a door in the back, and he opens the door and jumps off. He has a parachute, and he's never found. Some of that money was found later at different points in time, over the years. Some money was found 
in, in a river or a stream. Some money was found elsewhere. But all the money wasn't traced. And the guy was never identified. He was never caught. Now, I have a fr- well, not a friend, but I know this guy. His name is Chael Sonnen. He's a MMA fighter. So let me put Uncle Chael on the screen. Chael Sonnen. This guy. Uh, one of the MMA legends, mixed martial arts legends. So this guy claims that D.B. Cooper was his uncle. One of his uncles or someone he knew. That's what he claims. But Chael, we know that he has this habit of, he has this penchant for hyperbole and making tall stories. Very entertaining guy. But he claims that D.B. Cooper was his uncle. So we don't know. <laughs> so it's a mystery. We don't know what happened to him. But it looks like he got away with it. And he was successful in not just hijacking the plane, but getting away with all that money. Anyway, <laughs> some mysteries may never. Shale Sonnen never lost a round. Absolutely. <laughs> he never lost a round. Tremendous guy. Terrific guy. Ishan Patak says, what's the situation in Manipur right now? I have heard and saw a video where the cookie terrorists were stopping Indian Army convoy. The cookies have... Like I said, the situation has happened over almost a century. It is the fault of the Indian governments post-1947, post-1949, when Manipur became part of India, officially. They have let the situation go out of control completely. They never fenced the border. And today you have Kuki infiltrators who have overrun the southern half of Manipur, more than the southern half of Manipur, more than 50% of the territory of money of Manipur. If you look at satellite images of the past five, seven years, you will see thousands of new villages coming up in Manipur, in the forests and the hills of Manipur. They have completely overrun the place. To solve this problem is going to take time. This problem has happened over decades and decades, over more than a century, actually. The British start, they planted the seeds of this non, of this disaster. And the clueless Indian governments, starting from Mr. Nehru's government, they just let the situation run unchecked. And today, we have the situation. This is a geopolitical problem for India. It's not some random ragtag, half-naked outsiders who have come into India. Yes, they are, they are ragtag outsiders, infiltrators, but they are all somehow coordinated and controlled from somewhere. Okay? So this is a huge problem for our, for India and for Burma. And the root cause is in Myanmar. And it's not a difficult thing for India to go and cross the border and solve the problem or whatever is happening. But it's not that easy either. The moment you do that, the Americans will step into the picture. And they'll say that India is now becoming an expansionist nation. Like Russia with Ukraine. So right now, unfortunately, we'll have to bide our time. The first step is to start fencing the border, which will take years, but you're going to start somewhere. And there's going to be resistance from within, from without, and so on. So yes, the cookie terrorists are, are firing rockets, they're firing at farmers, they're doing, they're just, you know, rampaging across the place. There is no law and order in that region where the cookie terrorists are, have set up their villages. Thousands of villages, all outsiders, all foreigners. Okay? So yeah, it's it's a bad situation right now. Uh, India and Manipur in particular will have to swallow some pain for a long time. But hopefully things will get better and the indigenous people of India will get justice. Not the foreigners. Who cares about them? Out. Go back. And these cookies are not even Burmese, by the way. They don't speak the Burmese language. They don't practice Burmese culture. They don't even respect the Burmese nation. They came from Yunnan in China a few centuries ago, maybe 300 years ago or 400 years ago. But now their, their so-called scholars are rewriting history. They are in JNU and what, what not. We have given them privileges in our nation. So yeah, that's the deal right now with, the, with, with Manipur. Okay, let's take one more question. We have crossed two hours. We have crossed two hours, but let's take one more question. Somebody ask me a good question. Uh, okay, Pritesh Das says, why did Iraq really invade Kuwait? What were they trying to achieve? Did they seriously be- believe they could defeat the US? You see, 
there was something called the Iran Iraq war in the 1980s today you have a conflict in Ukraine it is a proxy war between Russia and the US and the US proxy is Ukraine the Americans will fight this war until the last Ukrainian is alive similarly there was a proxy war in the 1980s the Iran Iraq war Iraq was a proxy of the US the Americans wanted to destroy Iran and they ended up ruining both nations the outcome of the war was a stalemate nobody won nobody lost but both nations suffered horribly and the us puppet so to say was saddam hussein saddam hussein he he ran a tight ship in his country he did a great job administering his country and he believed that he had the blessings of the superpower the us and he could do whatever he want so let me try and grab some more territory so kuwait and iraq iraq are neighboring nations and there are oil wells massive oil wells in this region and the iraqis were alleging that kuwait was you know going underground and and tapping oil from iraqi reserves and there was the, the grudge that the iraqis had so saddam hussein asked the americans do you would you be okay if i went ahead and solve this problem and the americans gave him the green light they said go ahead you do that and the moment he does this the americans send this invasion force so they clearly had decided the americans that it is time for saddam hussein to be cut down to size so they made him believe that they were okay with his invasion of kuwait and then they used that as the pretext to destroy his nation and they eventually you know what they did to him so that's what happened he did not believe that saddam hussein did not believe that he could defeat the us he believed he they he had their blessing they fooled him as they have fooled so many people in the past all right with that we come to the end of today's ask abhijit episode episode 173 thank you so much for watching i'm going to end here uh, and i'll see you very soon in the next episode until then take care wherever you are have a good day good night keep raising your standards thank you bye until next time